Welcome to Africa 24 English, renowned for our expertise in finance and development with a distinguished career in major institutions such as the World Bank, the African Development Bank and the Trade Development Bank. Franny Luthi, CEO of Southbridge Investment, talks about the objectives of the financial institution and the impact of the diaspora on the continent in this new edition of Decryptage. Ms. Franny Luthi, welcome to Africa 24 English. First of all, can you present Southbridge Investment? What are your current objectives? So Southbridge Investment is, a, is part of the Southbridge Group, uh, which was created now close to seven years ago uh, by Dr. Kabaruka, who was the president of the African Development Bank, and Mr. Lionel Zinsu, who was at Rothschild for many years, but also former prime minister of Benin. And so they invited me to build the investment arm of Southbridge, which is Southbridge Investments. We are a Pan-African investment bank. So we invest across all of Africa from uh, uh, different locations. We have offices and presence in Kigali, in Abidjan, in Casablanca, in Mauritius, and very soon in uh, Johannesburg. Um, and we invest in a number of critical sectors for Africa. First, recognizing the importance of the banking sector, we have a platform that invests in digitizing small banks and networking them. We also have a platform to invest in restoration and reforestation of Africa's forests because Africa uh, is the lung of the earth uh, through its forests and we have a program to invest in restoring and uh, uh, reforesting Africa. And then those assets which are beneficial to communities can be brought to the African markets. The third area we focus on is health, uh, where we have a working capital facility for small and medium enterprises involved in the health sector. And we also are investing in renewable energy because uh, Africa needs energy and we have abundant sources of renewable energy, whether it's solar, wind, uh, geothermal, and so on. So we have a, a, a fund that focuses on that. And then we have a, a working capital facility that is 100% digital, investing in micro, small, and medium enterprises, because 70% of Africa's companies are micro and small and medium enterprises. So we provide financing to these companies. And other areas of our focus are, is on e-mobility, because Africa can transform its transport sector and move to a sector that uh, uses batteries and, and therefore can be charged through solar power. And so we are also looking at e-mobility. As the CEO of Southbridge Investment, one of your missions is to bring people together, assets and funds to help develop the continent. How far are you into this ambition and what is yet to be done? I think the impact of the diaspora is huge. Uh, estimates of how much the diaspora contributes to Africa's development show that at the moment it's over $100 billion that come from the diaspora into the continent. That is far higher than all the development aid that Africa receives. So the diaspora is a very powerful source of investment. But secondly, the diaspora is also a very powerful source of narrative for Africa, uh, talking about what is good and functioning well, showing African pride, and being able to contribute to global dialogue on issues that are relevant for Africa. For example, climate change, where Africa is being impacted. Africans in the diaspora working in international institutions like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, or even some of us in the investment sector give voice to African issues when we talk about those issues when we're discussing, for example, um, MDB reform, the reform of multilateral development banks, or climate change and climate finance, and so on. And then thirdly, Africans in the diaspora and Afro-descendants a big potential market for production of goods and services from Africa. If you look at how powerfully, for example, African music has been received across the world, it's because there's a huge demand that comes first from African diaspora and Afro-descendants that then transcends into the rest of the communities. Uh, and today, African artists fill uh, stadiums outside of Africa in very dynamic ways. We also contribute uh, in uh, cuisine. Uh, very famous uh, Senegalese chef, uh, Pierre Thiam, who is now very well known, uh, having a restaurant in New York with African cuisine. And that valorizes African culture, African traditions, 
and more importantly, African products. And that creates export markets uh, for Africa. And then finally, that the diaspora is very important on the intellectual uh, side as well in shaping uh, political thought, in shaping philosophical thought, and in also contributing to science so that things that are relevant and valuable for Africa can be studied, researched, and contributed uh, in a dynamic and international space that helps and supports Africa. In the framework of the West African Conference, what is your assessment of the impact of the diaspora around the continent? I think, first of all, and this is something that has come out through this dialogue we are having here in Mali, uh, which is to say, if Africa is home, then Africans can be Africans at home and Africans outside of home. And therefore, it should be easy for Africans in the diaspora and Afro-descendants to be able to come to Africa. And that's the whole uh, regime of uh, visa issuance, immigration policies, and the whole welcoming of people of African descent or people from the diaspora who want to come back to Africa. Second is the policy side, for example, investment policies. If Africans in the diaspora are bringing in $100 billion, which is larger than all the international financial aid coming to Africa, then the countries should have policies that are equally welcoming as they are, for example, for the World Bank or the IMF or the other uh, bilateral aid agencies that invest in Africa. And then finally, I think uh, it is very critical uh, for the media, and you play a very critical role in this space, to share African stories, not only for, from Africans on the continent, but also from Africans in the diaspora and Afro-descendants, so that we can learn more about each other, we can engage with each other and interact. And this is very important because nowadays the media is not just print media or television and radio, but it's also social media. And how print media, television and radio find themselves in social media and vice versa. Which means you can have a truly global dialogue in an instant with a message going across the world and back multiple times. Through your work and with the global impact of African creative industries, what in your opinion will be the best way to help Afro-descendants to reconnect with the motherland? So I'll start with how much we still have to do because uh, investment, uh, building an investment fund takes multiple years. And so we are very young. We are just about three years old on the investment side. We are about seven years old on the advisory side. Uh, so we are quite uh, far, I would say. First of all, in three years, uh, we've been able to grow a profitable business, which is quite difficult to do when you're in the investment space, because usually investment returns come in the later years. So that's one area of success we can quote. Secondly, uh, we have already aggregated support, for example, to make some of the investments that we will uh, issue around to small and medium enterprises, to communities and corporates more affordable by attracting philanthropic and grant capital. That is very critical because otherwise the, the, the cost of, of funding right now, the cost of capital is quite high because of the global interest rates. And therefore it's important to, to have uh, financing that is actually affordable. So we've also had that uh, already in place. For example, I mentioned the reforestation and restoration. We sponsored the creation of a foundation called the Vumbuzi Impact Africa Foundation, which is headquartered in Rwanda to oversee a Pan-African solution for restoration and reforestation and other important investments. So this foundation would be looking at 60, 100 years ahead, but would also be the, the vehicle that can receive grant money and philanthropic capital that can be used to then blend with commercial resources and make available affordable finance. We are also uh, on a journey now to close uh, two of our funds, which we anticipate to close by the end of this year. And uh, we have one platform that has been working and operating now for two years in Kenya and Ghana. And we are just about to launch in Cote d'Ivoire and Togo. And our target is to get to 10 countries in the next two to three years. So we have made progress in those last three years and we look forward to doing more. 
So hopefully when you talk to me next year or the year after, I can start to tell you about the companies we've invested in. But there's one of the platforms where we have made a post on LinkedIn because every year we celebrate that platform and it's called Pesapoa, which is cool money. And through that platform, we are uh, issuing working capital loans to meet micro, small and medium enterprises. As of today, through that platform, we've created more than 10,000 jobs. We've issued loans to almost 7,000, maybe nearly 8,000 companies. Uh, the companies that uh, borrow from that platform are about 80% of them in the food and nutrition value chain, and 47% of them are owned by women. So I think we've made already significant progress even in this short period of time. But of course, there is a lot more to do and we are working hard towards it. Ms. Fran Lutier, thank you for answering Africa 24's English questions.